Episode 5A of the first season of Spongebob contained this clip. It's not just a boulder, it's a rock. To summarize, Spongebob and Squidward are in the middle of nowhere as they try to deliver a pizza to a customer. Eventually, we arrive here. Spongebob states that this is no ordinary boulder, but instead, it's special in some way. It's not just a boulder, it's a rock. And it also ties to the history of today's archetype at Emancipator. So really, why was an Emancipator special? I'm positive you haven't been living under a rock, but in case you have, it's Block Dragon. That's the special ingredient that makes an Emancipator a rock and not a boulder. But before we can discuss the card itself, I'll explain the recipe to the deck as a whole. An Emancipator was released in April 2020 in the set Secret Slayers, which inadvertently redefined the power level of the game. Before this set, every archetype in the meta had either been around or have been getting hits over time. In January 2020, they released the ban list that killed the Eternal format, and a few months later, they killed the two best decks left over, being Spiral and Lunalite. The format kept getting hits because no new decks could keep up with the older cards. That is, until we finally got Secret Slayers. This meta warping set released two new archetypes that would define what Yu-Gi-Oh would feel like for the rest of 2020. The first of the two was Eldritch, a control-style deck that eventually was innovated to be somewhat degenerate with Halky Fibrax, Linkross, and Jet Synchron O-Lion combos. The second archetype, however, is the subject of this story, that being at Emancipator. This was a rock combo archetype that would go through different iterations, but mainly revolved around the quote-unquote miners, researcher, seeker, and analyzer. These three all shared the same effect to reveal the top five cards of the deck and special summon a rock monster from among them. In the theme, you would want to play their crystals, quote-unquote, to turn on specific effects of their in-theme synchros. But outside of the theme, the rock typing itself had one of the most most busted cards ever printed among them, that being Block Dragon. Now while this video isn't about the history of Block Dragon, it's important to recognize that this card is what made the deck so bonkers. It's such a crazy card in fact, that before we even got the right shell to utilize this dragon, we would see different archetypes try to abuse Block Dragon for the insane value it provides. This was most notably seen in Block Dragon Burning Abyss. Block Dragon has three effects. The first is to banish three earth monsters in order to summon itself from the hand or graveyard and you could do this as often as possible. The second effect gives rock monsters protection from card effect destruction, which was definitely not necessary, but made the deck even stronger for no reason. Finally, and most importantly, when it was sent from the field to the graveyard, you can add up to three rock monsters as long as their levels in total equal eight. So long story short, it's an infinitely recurrable body that every turn can search three monsters for free. It's not even that the cards are bad, because conveniently, all three miners are incredibly powerful. And and yet their total levels are 8, being 2 level 2s and 1 level 4. Go figure. It's no coincidence either, as there is no way Konami didn't have Block Dragon in mind when printing this archetype. The problem is, no one expected for the deck to evolve as it did. One other key piece is the Kawaki Mirus, but specifically Kawaki Miru Guardian. This rock monster can be summoned off the miners, and when this occurs, you can at any point tribute Guardian to negate a monster effect. This specifically was ridiculous for the deck, as it made it so difficult to hand trap them. If you don't don't hand trap a miner, they'll hit a guardian and negate your hand trap. If you use a hand trap, they'll make Halky Fibrax and still full combo. Through multiple hand traps, they can just summon Block Dragon and push through everything. This deck in its prime was, to put it bluntly, toxic. It could push through so many hand traps with ease, and anytime they saw a Block Dragon, it felt like the game was automatically over. Now to be fair, there are problems with the archetype. It was somewhat normal summon reliant, and without access to your miners, the deck didn't feel like it was doing anything. Regardless of these faults, however, the deck was definitely consistent and absurd for its time. It had all the right pieces to be meta and then some. Resiliency, longevity, power, and more. It had the pieces to a point where it genuinely is one of the most powerful decks ever conceived. Now that we understand the basics of the deck, it's time to dig further and figure out the history of this insanely strong archetype. But first, a quick plug about the coaching service Metafy. Metafy is a service that allows you to get coaching from the people kicking your butts online. Whether that be Super Smash Bros, Call of Duty, or 
are now Yu-Gi-Oh, this is a great opportunity for people to get coached by some of the best in the game. With that in mind, you can get coached by me. I'm not one to typically flex my accomplishments, but I'm most certainly a qualified player to help you get better at the game. And if you want me to help you get better, check out my Metify page in the description below. With that, let's get digging into this history. Secret Slayers came out in April 2020, the start of the quarantine era for, well, everyone. You may be questioning what form of tournaments we would even have at this point. While I can't classify them as equivalents to in-person Konami events, what I can discuss is the developments this archetype had over multiple months of online tournaments. When Secret Slayers first came out, we had the development that the Adamancipators could be mixed with rock decks, and thus came Go 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 Adamancipator. This build was focused around using the Go Go Go's and Log Dragon for longevity along with the ceiling and consistency of the Adamancipator tuner researchers for a ton of incredibly imposing boards. Then, we received one of the most silly synergies ever printed in the game, that being Halky Fibrax along with Link Ross. At first, Halk wasn't the end of the world, as it didn't technically do enough by itself. It was just a great extender. What changed was when Link Ross made Halky Fibrax a one-card everything, and thus came a much superior version of rocks that focused on turboing rank force for Gallant Granite and focused on tuners for Halky Fibrax to full combo through multiple hand traps. Combine these with Koaki Miru Guardian and Block Dragon, and the deck became resilient as can be. The deck when it drew normally was already strong, but with Block Dragon in hand, it became a toxic deck to deal with. Normally, I don't consider cards or decks toxic. I don't judge people for playing them, but the existence of the card in general makes for a much more broken atmosphere. A few cards or decks meet this criteria. Whether it was Goki and Firewall Dragon, Infernoble going first at full power, or in this case, at Emancipator drawing Block Dragon. These are examples of, in my own words, toxic gameplay, and Block Dragon is arguably the peak of these. It goes to show that any card with this much going on can be broken given the right shell. Over time, Ad Emancipator became more streamlined, and realistically needed to get hit. The first quarantine balance in June didn't actually impact the format, but by the time we got the September list, we needed change, and fortunately enough, Ad Emancipator received a Block Dragon ban. This ban directly destroyed the archetype for the time being. It was the best card they had, and now have lost all their grind game. The deck's still resilient and puts up great boards, but if these said boards are broken, it's all over for this rock archetype. This isn't to say that in the future Ad Emancipator can't make a comeback, but for now, this deck returns to being a boulder and not a rock like before. Rocks. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Just so you all know, I have an editor now. Say hi, Dyer. Hi, Dyer. Check me out here. So this is going to enable me to post more often. And I could not be more happy about working with Dyer. I'm happy to have him on, I guess, the Blade YGO team. Thank you all so much for watching. And with that, I hope to see you soon.